Hello there. Good morning. It is week four already. That's flying. And I'm here to give um, another brief video lecture on the week's topic. This week is relatively straightforward, I think, anyway. It's a, a rich, interesting topic about what is the self or the ego, or sometimes it's called the I or a person. They all have slightly different inflections of meaning, but it's basically the study, the philosophical study of anthropology or selfhood. Now, what you see in, in the philosophical tradition really is two trajectories, and chapter four in the book outlines this pretty well. The problem with the book, I'm finding anyway, is that it tends to stay put within 17th, 18th, and a little bit of 19th century philosophy. Um, supposedly, it doesn't venture into 20th century philosophy very often because it's probably just too complicated and too, too variegated. There's just too many schools of thought. But it's good to lay a foundation with some of the classical sources. So philosophy of the self would be really broken up into what you would call essentialism, that there is a standing, subsisting I or self that is like a unifying or organizing principle, something like a ghost in the machine or an immovable, simple soul that has no parts but is always there, and like a ballast keeping you rooted in who you are, and it organizes data around itself, like a piece of iron with, with fillings that gather around it, you know, like a, a magnet. Now that, that might go back to antiquity as well. That's a kind of, um, that's a long-standing philosophical notion of the self that comes under great scrutiny with the, the great two, what I would call empiricist figures, John Locke and David Hume. So I'm gonna have you write on David Hume a bit this week. So the other major trajectory of the self, if it's not, sorry, over here, if it's not essentialism, it would be the bundle theory or existentialism, basically, that you as a self have no essence, that you are what you do, and you are really to be reduced to a bundle of experiences. David Hume is famous, famous for this. Uh, the Scottish philosopher writing in the 1740s, 1750s, who's still relevant, wrote very famously that uh, he's baffled when he looks inside of himself, as if he takes a kind of non-optical look inward and says, where is myself? I'm looking to find myself. Where am I? I see nothing but a bundle of impressions or sense impressions or experiences. So that's one way to see the self independent of essentialism. And it's usually seen as a critique of oppressive theories of the self that we have to be one certain way. So Hume would say we're actually a series of actions and experiences and we're always changing and moving and shifting and we're elusive and we don't have a pure subsisting ego that roots me in myself. There is no even necessarily a soul. So this is the philosophical tradition that takes off with Locke and empiricism. Now Locke, writing a generation before Hume, would talk about, very fascinating, and again, people still talk about him in this regard, is that I am nothing but the memory of myself. So I am myself as long as I remember myself. So people who are amnesiacs, maybe global amnesiacs who don't remember anything about their narrative, their life, their family of origin, their job, their career, when they went to university, if anything, they remember nothing of their narrative, they would no longer be themselves. They would have lost their sense of personal identity. Um, so Locke, again, would be a kind of existentialist and then basically saying that we are what we do as we exist and we can change, we're plastic, we're malleable, we're not tied down to one particular essence. This gets um, developed in important ways in 20th century philosophy, specifically with existentialism, in which... Jean-Paul Sartre and Martin Heidegger would say that existence precedes essence, meaning we create who we are through projecting possibilities. And it was a very wildly successful and um, 
it got a lot of notoriety and publicity, a wildly successful philosophical sensibility. So that's, that's really the paradigm of the self. It comes down to two almost opposing um, models or traditions, maybe intellectual traditions within philosophy of how do we, how do we understand the self. Now, somebody like Immanuel Kant will say there has to be, or Edmund Husserl in the 20th century would say there's a lot of room for development and change, but there has to be some kind of almost like anonymous, minimal sense of self that remains like a bedrock that can help us develop but never leaves who we are. And then in the, 19, in the 1960s and 70s, you had something like the narrative self evolve, uh, emerge and then evolve, basically saying that we are the story we tell about ourselves, that we're constantly constructing our personal identity and we don't do it consciously, often it's unconsciously, and that we're more of um, something like a product of our environment, the narratives that our environment tells about us and who we are. So if I'm American and I'm white and I grew up in the Midwest, I'll have a particular narrative of what I should be like, what life is like, and that is that it kind of endows me with my sense of self. If I were black and grew up in New York City, I'd have a different narrative. If I were Chinese and I grew up in France, I would have a different narrative. Um, or if I were French and grew up in France, I'd have a different narrative than someone who was an immigrant and lived in France. So those are the kind of um, differences. I think it's an exciting area because you're talking about some of the most basic questions of what it means to be me. And so I want you to think about that. The narratives, the stories, the, the experiences, are they, if you put them together, is that you? Are you nothing but a kind of center of gravity of your narratives and experiences, or is there something more essential to who you are? And if so, do you have access to that? That's the main question chapter four continues to ask. And if you're nothing but your memory of yourself, you know, memories can be not as crisp as the chapter will say, the further we look back. And there are times where I don't recognize me when I look at something I've done 15 or 20 years ago. I was reading something that I wrote as an undergraduate, where you are now, when I was like 19 or 20. And I was like, I don't recognize that me writing that. That's not who I am now. I've changed so much. Yet, I haven't completely changed. Friends from childhood would still recognize me as me. Um, so anyway, those are some, some thoughts for you to consider as you do the reading. I think the reading is pretty interesting and accessible this week, so enjoy, and I'll have the discussion question for you on Hume and what's called the bundle theory of the self.